Um, so we're really fortunate to have for our first keynote speaker today, uh, somebody that I know well and who probably thought that he'd got away from me interviewing him several years ago, but sadly not. Uh, Mark Thompson is Chief uh, Operator, Chief Executive Officer uh, of the New York Times Company. Um, I knew Mark in his iteration first as actually a journalist um, and then later as somebody who ran both the most important public service broadcaster in the commercial sector in Britain, which is uh, Channel 4, and then Director General of the BBC. Um, so there are very, very few people in the world who have Mark's both global insight and also now uh, he's just been complaining about how difficult it is to write things. Um, his insight into uh, actually putting together um, both newspapers, uh, digital assets, um, and broadcast. Uh, and we're really, really grateful to have him here today. Not least because the New York Times, which is, you know, we always feel like it's a, a sort of a, a, an institution which is kind of sort of bound in some ways to Columbia Journalism School, we have a long association uh, with the organization, um, but which has also been proved, uh, proving to be a very interesting uh, experiment in how you transform a legacy news organization into something which is robust uh, and fit for the future. Um, and to that point, we had, uh, I think last month, you had your path ahead uh, future document, which was really an 11-page summary, I said yeah. summary, yeah. Uh, of the strategy for the New York Times here on in. Um, tell us a bit about that and just tell, just, just so people who don't know or haven't caught up with it are familiar with what you've been saying to your staff and out there on the road. Okay, and the dirty secret, good news folks, is we've got some PowerPoint. Otherwise, we, we, yes, the dirty secret is there's PowerPoint, but it's going to feel like a conversation. <laughs> if it feels like PowerPoint, you're allowed to leave. Okay. I, I, I will try and make it really quick. Um, okay, we hit, hit the next slide. Um, yeah, so this is... Uh, this is Tyler Hicks, a uh, 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 great, great uh, photojournalist, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner. I think he's on the road. Uh, it's, this is Libya, 2011. I think it's the road between um, Tripoli and, and, and Miserata. At this point in, in, in time, this is one of the most dangerous spots on, on, on Earth at, at, at the time. Uh, 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 a, a great colleague of mine at the BBC uh, was shot by a, 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 and, and survived by a bullet which hit two other journalists, killing one of them. Um, Big open country and a kind of ragged front line between Gaddafi and and, uh, the, and the rebels. Um, in a way, Tyler sits at the top of a of a pyramid. It takes a lot to to get Tyler there. I mean, there's the immediate, the best safety training, the best security you can provide, and the kind of system 31 Foreign Bureau, a whole kind of system of doing international news. But below that, you've got a company and a family, the Ox Salzburger family, who are committed to this kind of journalism. And at the base of the pyramid, you've got readers who also are committed and in many cases are prepared to pay for it. And I guess the single most important thing to say is, and we want this line, secure our journalistic mission for the long term and create one of the world's most successful digital content businesses. I always want to say it's secure our journalistic mission for the long term by creating one of the world's most successful digital content businesses and it's create one of the world's most successful digital content businesses by securing and building it from our journalistic mission. So whereas an awful lot of news organizations are saying this is the stuff, you know, people don't love it, it's a bit, I mean, remember one, <laughs> one heads of the American networks uh, uh, telling me about, uh, asking whether the BBC mm. would like to do all their foreign coverage, mm -hmm. saying, you know, our viewers find foreign news a bit dispiriting. Um, <laughs> uh, they, prefer, they prefer domestic features. Um, it's changed uh, in America now, where they actually they find domestic news quite dispiriting well. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> where to look next, eh? Uh, um, but, but we believe, it's, it, it's, it's contrary in general, but we, we believe and we're, we're proving out mm. that there is a big dedicated and engageable audience for what Tyler does. Right. Okay, next slide. And we've set ourselves this fairly uh, simply stated, um, uh, uh, um, arguably reasonably alarming goal, which is the double digital revenue. We, we did it, we've pretty much done it between, uh, by 2015, we'll, we'll have more than doubled it since 2010. We're, we're, our, we're saying that by 2020, we'd like to double our digital revenue again. This is pure digital revenue. We're not ascribing any value, 1.1 million print subscribers get complete digital access, that's not included. This is just uh, 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 digital advertising, uh, digital only subscription, and um, other bits and bobs, digital archive, uh, actually very nice little digital crossword business and so on. 
Um, uh, we haven't got a, uh, a, a big new lever to pull like uh, uh, launching a new pay model. We've done that. Right. Um, uh, we do believe, however, uh, this, is a, this is achievable. And although, uh, and the, there are many quarters where we hit the numbers you'd need to to hit this. So, you right. know, 14% um, year over year dig digital uh, revenue growth. Um, and this is something the organization, um, uh, the whole organization, uh, is committed to. Right. Is committed to. Next slide. How do we do it? More than doubling the number of most engaged users. We can talk about mm -hmm. what we mean by yep. most engaged, but more than double the number of most engaged users. That means reaching out to beyond our heartland in the US and new audiences here. Mm -hmm. It means really connecting with, and not shallow. I mean, our thesis is a big top of the funnel, reaching tens of millions of people is really good to get people to sample what you do. In terms of monetization, it, it's less helpful than many of our competitors think. Right. Uh, in our case, 90% of our digital revenue comes from 12% of the visitors. How um, old are they, that 12%? Uh, um, the, so, the, so the answer is the average is um, kind of low 40s, low 40s. Right. Uh, and by the way, with plenty of, of millennials in the mix and, and, and uh, younger audiences as well, um, but you're right, demographics are one thing we've got to look at in the US and around the world. We want to be the best digital news destination in the world, contrarian. We believe that although, and we'll talk about it, yes, I'm we'll sure, we want to yeah. sample, um, sample uh, uh, people to be able to sample the, the Times journalism in all sorts of places. We want to be a destination. We want to become a daily habit, um, very much in the spirit of the legacy of the Times. We want people to come back again and again to us, and we have some ideas about how to do that. Um, we see our business as a subscription first business. Doesn't mean that we can't make a great offering to advertising. We believe we can grow digital advertising strongly. But everything we do, we, every piece of journalism we do, we want it to be worth paying for. I mean, demonstrably worth paying for. So again, that's slightly unlike many other people's view. Um, a pivot around innovation is really good for us uh, in all sorts of ways. It's essential, digital advertising is essentially a technology challenge now. Uh, and we have to constantly innovate, both in terms of technology and creativity, if we want to grow digital advertising. We also think that actually trying to work hard on storytelling, mm -hmm. this is absolutely, you know, if Dean McKay were here, he'd say exactly the same thing, that actually trying to figure out how to tell compelling stories on, in environments like smartphone, and, and innovating and get a getting a reputation for innovation Virtual is reality, key. Even. We'll come on to that. Uh, 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 and here we are. Um, uh, uh, here's some stats from literally the last 24 hours. Uh, uh, our, our VR app has, has, has been downloaded faster than any app we've ever done, including the main Times app. Uh, uh, we d we've delivered so far 1.3 million uh, uh, Google Cardboard devices. Average time spent on the app so far is 14.7 minutes, an astonishing number. Does that, does that strip out the time which people spend like it's like the, the <laughs> VR. You know they know what other I'm talking people, about. Emily, other people, Emily. Other people were able to assemble like, the device. I, listen, I have I have, <laughs> I have I have teenage children, and mine were you know oh yeah that thing. Um, it's no, I was just thinking it's that's time on that's time on that's time on the app. app. Right. The longest film on the app is 11 minutes. 14.7 right. means right. multiple uh, consumptions and trending on Twitter. So so and the, the last one on the previous slide. We don't need to go back to it. Is, is is also trying to essentially figuring out, goes back to the innovation report, we're all in it together. Right. This, is, this is something we've got to work on as an organization and we need to begin to, you know, without in any way stepping back from yep. the ideals of Times Journalism, we need to do this in a kind of combined, multidisciplinary, joint way. Right. I mean, let's just go back, um, so, so to, to, to really sort of pick apart some of that. The figure that has in a, been- In a good way. In a good way, yeah. entirely good way. Um, the figure that people have really focused on is, is, is that. I noticed you put it in a nice Death Star color of uh, the dark column that takes us to $800 um, million a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said, um, we don't have any new levers to pull there. Um, it, it, but what I mean by that is, is fundamental um, um, uh, uh, structural changes. There are, there are ideas out there, but the core of the 800. Right is going to come um, from continuing to grow our subscription business yeah. and continuing to develop and innovate around our digital advertising business. Mm. Now, there are, I mean, you know, the, the, something we don't think we've done uh, well enough yet 
is fully reflecting digital, the kind of incredible breadth of the New York Times right. in terms of culture, right. lifestyle, and leisure. So there's, in terms of content, the, the actual content um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, creation by our digital uh, our, our newsroom is far wider than digital consumption would currently, which is very right. focused around news and opinion. Right. So there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's many different parameters, and we haven't, we're only just really beginning to get serious about building international yep. audiences as well. So, so there's plenty of ways of growing it. So one of the, re so, so one of the levers you can pull, or that has been handed to you in the past 12 months, mm. is this distributed model, which goes, Facebook yeah. can reach 1.3 billion people, Instant articles means that they can be reached very quickly. You now have all of these other sort of competing channels, whether it's Snapchat and uh, Discover, whether it's uh, Apple News, etc. Um, and you're building a strategy which is not, doesn't seem to be centered on that. You're, you're building a strategy which looks as though you're, you're, you're doubling down on destination well, it's rather it's than distribution. It's complicated, but it's a, remember, it's a strategy for, for significantly building engaged audiences as well. Right. Um, and, um, uh, and what that means is continuing to um, do an effective job in converting, as it were, near at hand and already quite engaged audiences. But also, you, we've got to reach out deeply out into the world to try and build new audiences, and not just new passing trade who bump into you once a month, but, but audiences who over time come to really rely on you. And the, the free distribution which all these other platforms represent, is very attractive. Um, the thing that we've got to do is work out and be fairly precise about what is it that we have to gain from very wide distribution and what should the boundaries be. And what we have to gain is the influence of the, of, of the New York Times, it's journalism in America and around the world, it's giving people a, a, a chance to sample, get used to, begin to understand the value of, of Times journalism. But we, we would do that, and by the way, of course, there's some, mon some monetization through, through um, eyeballs on, on, on digital advertising. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we believe that to, to get the core of our, our, our business model to work, which we need to do to, to fund outstanding journalism, we need to have a, a kind of a direction in mind, and the direction is deeper engagement, and wherever possible, guiding people to complete experiences all the time. So one basic point, which is I think a disagreement between us and Silicon Valley, is we do, do not regard and do not want to regard journalism as a series of kind of, as it were, commoditized bricks, right. where anyone can collate them, um, they can be consumed, bricks can be consumed from you know, multiple different sources in any order anyone chooses. We, we would much rather think of what we have as a relationship with a reader. Oh and offering experiences where there are very strong incentives for the, for the reader to enjoy the experience across different topics, different subjects, uh, uh, different categories of content, and in different times during the, during the course of the day and the week. So we have a different view about the kind of experience we're trying to offer our, our, our users, the most engineers let, let me just, in Silicon let me just, Valley do. Let me just stop you there and go back to that, because that's a really crucial and interesting point, where you say you don't want journalism, not just the New York Times, you don't want journalism to be consumed, or you think consumed as a series of bricks, which are... With an assumption of commoditization, yeah. an assumption right. that it, when you get right down to one bricks, uh, uh, right. another, and with all sorts of other kind of crude assumptions that when you've read one, sto one, one yeah. treatment of a certain story, you're done sort of thing, which is obviously not the way people consume do you? But do you have any evidence from, uh, because you're already experimenting with instant articles, you don't, I don't think you have a, do you have a Snapchat channel? Um, we have a relationship, we don't have a Snapchat channel. Right, okay, yeah. no, no New York Times Snapchat, that will be... Um, I can't wait for the David Brooks uh, uh, Snapchat. Um, but the, uh, but, 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 but the, you know, the serious point there is, um, do you think, uh, and not just with your New York Times hat on, but you know, with your, 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 your journalistic hat on, do you think that there is something which fundamentally changes the relationship between the news audience and the news when it's consumed in a social stream, which is detrimental? Well, I want to say this. I think if you produce commodity news, don't be surprised if your news is treated as a commodity. So in other words, a large amount of the news produced in the world is produced in a way where, I mean, bluntly, it's not worth paying for, and it can be interchangeable with other uh, news from other providers. Right. Uh, and so uh, to me, it's more a question of a, of a battle um, 
for, for figuring out and doubling down on the things that make your journalism distinctive and valuable so it stands out and feels exceptional and, and, and encourages consumers to, to, to experience it in a distinctive way. Um, so to me, this is fundamentally about a battle, which is, I think it's, you know, at the core of this is actually journalistic rather than to do with like a business plan, about how you think about um, uh, 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 distinctiveness and uh, exceptionality in journalism. That could be keeping your foreign bureaus going when everyone right. else has shut them. Yep. It could be innovation. It could just be uh, something very traditional, an incredible legacy of attention to detail, authority, uh, uh, be believability, uh, voice, to distinctive tone of voice, and so on. But, but to me, that's, that's, it's almost table stakes if you want to do something which is not going to be sliced and diced by others. So there are lots of other companies who we hear a lot about, you know, the, 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 um, the Vices, the BuzzFeeds, the Vox.coms Vox in this world, who, who are going in a slightly different direction, who are saying... Yeah, and I think, by the way, in some ways, I think Vice and BuzzFeed are going in, in different di directions to each other. And I think, by the way, that I would absolutely say for other people, other models may well work. Um, uh, um, but that doesn't mean I think they would work for the New York Times. Um, Vice, I, I think, um, uh, and I talk quite a lot of Shane, um, I think Vice has done a really, really interesting in, in, in job in presenting itself. Uh, there's some truth in it, there's some marketing in it as a, a, an incredible solution for a particular demographic and a particular flavor, which in particular television is very, very focused on trying to get to. Mm -hmm. And there's some very, very rich deals and investments which have come from that. BuzzFeed, I think, is, is very, very interesting. Uh, a lot of their model depends on superlative um, algorithmic um, or audience development techniques. Um, and I think they are extremely good and they move very fast. If you had to bet on anyone in that world, you, I think you'd bet on those guys. I want to say, I think that's quite hard to defend in the long term, particularly if the platforms on which you're placing your stuff, who are the most advanced technology companies in the world, decide to compete with you. Do you think that's a possibility? I, I think one way of reading what's happening at the moment is it's a, it's a coming reality. Explain a little bit more. Well, what I mean what by, that, by that, is, that is is that if 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 um, um, Facebook uh, has it in mind to keep as many people on the Facebook um, environment for as long as possible and regards content and the the algorithmic um, uh, optimization of of content as part of that strategy they'll do it better than anyone else in the world. So effectively you're saying when Facebook decides who is going to succeed, Facebook can decide who is going to succeed in that world. Well, but, but there's some things they to. can't do. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, I, I mean, I you know, defer to no one in my admiration for Facebook's um, uh, skills at what they do. They're not journalists um, um, uh, and, and don't claim to be. I don't think they understand uh, a journalism as such. And uh, uh, the point of, of competition where I would like the New York Times to succeed is, is doing the best journalism in the world. Now, I think we need to be intelligent and assiduous in finding audiences for that journalism. And that means that we, too, are massively focused on, you know, data science, machine learning, uh, 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 the, the, the best possible way in which you develop your audience. But I want to be clear that our point of competitive advantage for me is Tyler Hicks. Right. And when you said, so, so talking about the, we want, this is a journalistic mission. You know, this is, this is yeah. uh, you're only doing this not necessarily to make shareholders delighted. I didn't say that. I, I, well, I, I, I said something slightly different, which is, which is, which is I think you, we, we will defend our right. journalistic mission by making a great success of our digital business. Right. So shareholders will be delighted, but journalism will continue to be the core cool mission. Um, and I, and I, I just say, I, I just worry a little bit about uh, the underlying assumption sort of behind the question you were going to ask, which is... That there's the question a, I was going to ask. Uh, uh, this is, a, this there's is why a, I love interviewing you, there's, an, the, 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 there's yeah. an inevitable trade-off between right. those two? Yes. Well, it, OK, so let's talk about that. Is there an inevitable trade-off? Because it seems, no. as though, it seems as though one of the great revelations, particularly, I think, in the American market, less so in the European market, of the last 10 years is that excellent journalism does not make money always. 
you know, it doesn't it doesn't correlate. You can do it, but excellent journalism can actually. Well, I'm not. I'm not saying. More money than I'm not saying generate. it's automatic that excellent journalism leads to profits. Mm. But, but I, I don't accept there's a natural tension. I mean, I don't accept that journalism's the one industry in the world where high quality puts all customers off and, 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 and means that you know, you're unlikely to succeed if you improve the quality of your goods. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a very deep cultural pessimism <laughs> if you believe that the, the better the stuff is, the less likely it is to succeed. So, so, so I, I, what I would say is it, the New York Times essentially for 164 years has, has, has run a successful business based on differentiating on quality. Oh. And um, uh, although I accept it's possible that there's a new law of physics and, um, uh, or a new law of human nature and people no longer want to pay for high quality, that's possible, oh. I think it's highly unlikely. And I think at the moment we are producing great journalism. I think in, in recent years, under Jill Abramson who's here today and under, under Dean Bacay, the, the New York Times is as good journalistically as it has been at any point that I'm aware of in its history. Uh, um, uh, and we continue to make money. And I think profitability this year will be higher, like for like, than it was in 2010. Just to, let, let's, let's just sort of um, look at some of the perhaps sort of more mundane figures underneath it rather than the, the, the just the high level um, concepts, which is so you have been experimenting with. Uh, instant articles a little bit. You sure. haven't taken the route that Jeff Bezos and Marty Barron have taken, which is to say the Washington Post is all in. You know, we might as well publish every single article we do in two environments. Um, you know, sits on our own site, our own apps, but also we're going to experiment by putting everything onto yeah. the social platform and as I well. And I think if you want, if, I mean, the, the Washington Post has, has got a very clear target. And again, I'm not going to criticise them because, you know, everyone's got their own, their own view of the future, which is underdetermined. None of us know for sure. Um, the Washington Post has, has made a clear target to get to 100 million unique users a month. Right. Pretty much come what may. If that's what you want to do, I think going all in uh, on instant articles might well be part of a, a sensible strategy. That the point where I'm... I'm skeptical. Uh, um, um, the Wall Street Journal um, a few months ago had some numbers. I don't know if they're true. They sounded pretty credible, and they were denied about the Huffington Post's numbers in 20, 2014. I, I, I recall 145 million uh, 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 dollars of, of, of digital revenue through digital advertising at. I think 205 million monthly uniques. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a curve there, a plateauing effect uh, on very large audience sizes. And I think very broad but very thin um, uh, uh, distribution of content. And also that scenario, if you look closely at the numbers, where a lot of the actual traffic to a site is non-congruent with the site's the stated brand. Right. So in other words, it's the clickbait. Yes, it's the clickbait. It's the sidebar of shame. I don't know where that goes. I yeah. don't know. I mean, I literally don't know where. I mean, what's, mm. if you like, the most encouraging thing about the New York Times, frankly, is the readers of the New York Times. And, you know, Syria, Iraq, you know, these, these are high hitting, big audience stories for the Times. Right. I mean, you can talk about time spent. That's an important yep. um, point of engagement. What's really interesting is the mapping of journalistic seriousness oh. and, and engagement and scale. And our big stories, um, The Lonely Death of George Bell, this oh. very long piece of journalism, 9,000 word piece of journalism about a, 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 you know, a man um, dying in, in terrible, lonely circumstances in New York City and the kind of industry around that. It's a gigantic, gigantic story and again very long session times of people getting through 9,000 words How many on people read it? I, 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 the last, I, I, I haven't got an answer for you. Last, I looked 24 hours, 48 hours in, I think it was well over a million people at that point. Long session times and about a third of the people reading, reading this really long piece of journalism on a smartphone. I heard so, somebody said that the Amazon piece had been read five million times. Yeah and, and, and the other interesting thing is there's another I think um, uh, misconception Maybe it's the way we talk about news, which always sounds like it's super short half-life, mm. you know, instant, the quicker you're there, the better. Once you've read the news story, it's happened. These big stories, the, 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 the big enterprise stories, have a life over weeks and months. 
And I think it's very interesting. I mean, the, the, the New York Times in particular, the, in terms of the corpus of content, it's about 300 pieces of content a day, a significant part of, of, of that content has persistence in terms of interest and, and, and value and people coming back to it, which stretches over months and sometimes years. Do you see anything in the reach and performance of the articles that you have put out on third-party platforms um, which suggests that you will do much more of it? In other words, do the, do the numbers actually make sense? Well, I mean, I think there's no question, um, firstly, that um, uh, latency mm. is something consumers don't like. And so um, uh, um, uh, technologies like uh, Google's AMP and uh, uh, Facebook intimate articles, which um, reduce uh, latency to a ne negligible amount of time, significantly um, um, uh, uh, affect engagement. So, so, so that's, a, that's a basic lesson. They are solving uh, um, uh, a problem which is, you know, you can argue how serious the problem is. It's definitely, uh, definitely something which is, is to some degree uh, has been limiting the 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 um, the, the uh, quality of the user experience for some users. So that's definitely happening. Um, we're performing well, and these the articles in these areas are, are, are still relatively early days, and for us, relatively small amounts of content. But they're performing pretty well in these in in, in these environments. Um, and I think we're learning. Uh, we'd like more data, I and mean, we would like to know more about in detail what's going on. Um, uh, uh, we'd like to look at. Uh, and get to a to a, a more tangible place in terms of how we relate all of this activity to our subscription model. Um, that's the subject of ongoing conversation with all, all of these partners. Um, um, but but you know f for us it's a kind of it's a, it's been a useful learning experiment. I'm going to turn it over to uh, audience questions in a second. So if you have a question, can you queue up at sorry line up um, at the mic there? That's not because we won't run around with. Uh, microphones, it's just that um, it's not captured on the live stream if we do. So anyone with a question, go, 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 please um, please join the line. Um, yeah. I just want to ask a, a, one final question, really, which is um, about this sort of this, this, mer this almost in the mobile social world, we are seeing this mo much tighter relationship between the commercial side and the editorial side. It's a relationship which is almost forced by format, I would say. Uh, it's, you know, if Apple decides that ad blocking software um, is going to be something which it stocks in its app yeah. store, um, what are the kind of, what are, what, are the, what are the challenges? Are you having to make compromises now with branded comp content that you wish you weren't? No, no. And I, I think that the segregation between um, uh, editorial decision making about what stories um, um, uh, uh, the New York Times does, and what order and in what way they should run, should be 100% under the control of uh, Dean Bouquet, Andy Rosenthal, the editorial department, uh, and their colleagues, and 0%, 0% in the control of the commercial divisions of the company. Um, so you don't have a reporting line on that? I don't have a reporting line, and I don't want a reporting line on that. Um, um, uh, I've done quite enough of that myself. Uh, uh, yes, indeed. But I think that's, and it's there for a good reason. It's, it's, it's because of conflict of interest. However, I want to say, and it's not just mobile, it's everything, essentially. By the way, including the future of the print, print platform, which also requires innovation, it requires continuous change. Um, I literally don't know what a kind of business side strategy would look like. I, I mean, I, I literally, I, mean, I suppose, sort of sell more ads sort of oh. thing. But, but it, it, it's meaningless now. Um, uh, it's meaningless. Uh, the future um, is based around the experience that readers are going to have of what we do. And that experience is definitionally a mixture of a journalistic component, a design component, uh, uh, a technology component, but to include commercial and and uh, uh, and marketing uh, uh, and subscription components in a great big melange. That's how it presents to the reader. It's you know the future is a single stream. Stuff needs to be clearly labelled, and everything we do in terms of future strategy is going to have to be done together. Okay. First question. Thanks. You've just answered uh, a couple of the questions I was about to ask. I'm Peter Bale from the Centre for Public Integrity. I wanted to ask you about, I think Michael Wolfe has criticised you for not paying enough attention to the newspaper. Um, can you tell us about the newspaper a little bit as a luxury product potentially and what the sale of the FT meant to it 
and then elaborate a little bit more on the advertising. What, what excites you in the advertising area? Because it's been very much focused on journalism, but less, less so on some of the creative work you're doing in advertising. Okay, thanks. Thank yeah, sure. So I, I, I missed uh, Michael. I, I find it hard to catch up with everything Michael it's writes. It's but, a part but, of it. If we all had to respond to everything that Michael criticizes for us all the time, we wouldn't get much else done. <laughs> So, so, I mean, actually, I, I would say that, I, I mean, I think it's incredibly important that we regard the physical newspaper as a platform which requires incredible attention, it requires investment, it requires, you know, again, its own plans for the future. And, and um, um, uh, recently, we've, we've um, uh, 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 massively rebooted the New York Times magazine under Jake Silverstone. We put a lot of new money into it. Jake is right at the center of the VR. Um, exercise. That's a, a New York Times physical magazine-led digital exercise. There's nothing gives me more delight than a um, you know Sunday physical New York Times arriving with a blue bag with a, a piece of cardboard in it, which helps you look at virtual reality. That's good. Uh, we launched a men's style section because we thought there was a particular opportunity in the market. That this is partly an advertising opportunity, also a great stuff. Men, men are more interested in style. Lot of seer sucker. Um. <laughs> It's like a day joke. Um, I always like to get one of those in. Um, to me, advertising, uh, significantly, advertising is, 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 is going to need to be an area of creativity. Uh, at the most practical level, I was at the, uh, our printing plant at College Point yesterday. We bought a folding machine, an amazing German folding machine, and we can do something called a panoramic eight, which is a, mm. an eight sheet folding uh, uh, ad where we can do. Uh, single photographs, which are four full page uh, s sizes. Um, uh, we are going to be launching, uh, I believe, continue to look at l launching new sections, sometimes closing sections. Um, and we've got a team of people thinking, I mean, what, in let's take 2020, our kind of end point in, our, in, in that financial, financial model. How does a physical paper, we're going to be printing the newspaper oh. for many years to come. How does a physical newspaper continue to surprise and delight its readers and fit in in a world where most people are getting most of their news, the same people from, from um, smartphones and other digital devices. How do you adapt it? How do you develop it? How do you keep it fresh? And I, I think, you know, it, rather than just seeing that, I mean, cost, of course, the whole time cost is an issue. Okay. Seeing it as not just a cost issue, but as an area where we should still be innovating. And I think, you know, this Sunday's VR experiment is a really good example. So, you said, I mean, you said uh, we'll carry on printing the newspaper for many, many years to come. That's not always that that hasn't been the conversation in every single news organisation around the world. Often it is about, at some point, we have to think about reconfiguring print. Can you, can you imagine a time where the New York Times will not be coming out seven days a week as a paper product? Um, when we look at the financial projections, even on quite adverse uh, uh, expectations or uh, adverse scenarios in terms of... Uh, uh, I mean, we have a newspaper which, if there was no print advertising, would still be contribution margin positive. We, there would still be cash, positive right. cash flow. Uh, um, uh, it's a newspaper which, as far uh, as far as we can see, um, uh, we, I say even with quite you know kind of kind of poor case on advertising and and uh, 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 consumer revenue scenarios, is profitable seven days a week. Um, for many, many years to come. So if you're saying, can you imagine a point in the future? Of course you can, or maybe it's a point in the future where actually, if you want a physical newspaper, you know, there's an A3 printer um, um, at home which delivers it to you, you know, along with your kind of freshly brewed cappuccino every morning. I mean, there are scenarios where, uh, in the same way, the, the interesting persistence of physical books, it may be that for a, a core audience, the physical paper makes sense. But I think it won't make sense by accident or by simply clinging on to history. It'll make sense because we've, we've thoughtfully and creatively and intelligently figured out how to continue to keep it fresh and relevant in the future. And just to finish on this big question of you know, the, the, the tension um, uh, between the new distribution um, technologies, the ways of, of, of finding and paying for journalism, and if you like, the, sort of the traditional models of having a... Having a um, uh, a destination. What are your, you know, you you sound like you're really not worried about that relationship at all. Well, I want to say, I think the smartphone is a place of destinations, uh, much more than the web. I think we're moving back to a world of destinations. 
Facebook wants to be a destination. Oh, yes. the, the, the issue, and it's a very interesting point for journalism, is whether you've got the guts and the confidence to say we're going to be a destination ourselves or whether we're going to be on, I mean, I, I think of in, in the UK, and I think they do in some parts of the US as well, um, on some trains, there'll be a person with a little trolley pushing uh, uh, the trolley down the train, selling, you know, potato chips and, uh, and coffees and the rest of it. Uh, um, and I sometimes think of a kind of a bit of a kind of cringe in journalism, which is, you know, can we push our little trolley down your train? Uh, 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 we want to be we want to be a destination, and we think we have the brand and the clout to be a destination. Now, I'm not saying that every journalistic organisation has currently got the strength to be a destination, but we think that you know when we think of that world of apps of the uh, of you know billions of smartphones, uh, most of them with users using a relatively small number of apps, we think some of those apps will be news apps and we want to be one of those news apps. That's a great point on which to finish. We were going to hear some different views on that later in the day. We have Michael Reckow here, who's the um, uh, product manager for Facebook, who's going to be keynoting the second half of the day. Um, but I just want to thank you, Mark, for coming and being very frank uh, with what you think. Um, what, just one, one, one final question, which is, what is the research question you would like us to answer? whether it's people in this room, researchers, students, uh, Facebook, um, other journalists. What is the interesting question well, the, about the, where the, we're the going? The biggest, biggest thing we're trying to figure out at the moment, I would say, it, well, this is the class of question. How do, we, how do we get the chances of somebody who's read one news story to read a second news story from the New York Times? Now, this very quickly gets you into probabilistic topic modeling and yes. other advanced, but, but if, we can get, if we can figure out ways of connecting the pearls into a necklace of, 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 of de-atomizing what we do, so we, we're beginning to turn out things like briefings, for example, if we can begin to start pivoting away from an assumption by everyone, including some readers, that you read stories, this story, that story, and the other story, and they could come from three different sources, three different subjects, or whatever, to more of a sense, um, part of it's some of the spirits of television scheduling and programming, how you think about you know, giving people an expectation of, of one kind of genre after another, or two examples, one comedy after another, that's part of it. Part of it's quite hard machine learning. But I think the challenge of how you stop um, being treated as if you were a pile of random bricks to be thrown in with everyone else's random bricks, that's a good question. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Thank you.